everyone this is sonali thank you all for carving out some time for attending today's webinar on funding scenario during and post covid 19 to all the attendees out there please type in any questions you might have in the q and a section and we'll try to answer as many as possible at the end of the session request you to keep the questions within the scope of today's discussion and not to your personal business queries i would now like to introduce our speaker He is a serial tech entrepreneur, investor, and TV host who started his first startup at the age of 19 around his patent-pending technology while still studying as a computer engineer at the Illinois Institute of Technology. He built it into a multi-million dollar valuation by the age of 22. He has built eight businesses in the U.S. and India with multi-million dollars worth of products and services. As the great great grandson of Sarojini Naidu he continues the legacy forward by tirelessly serving the Indian youth through entrepreneurship education using lean startup methodology and principles of Bhagavad Gita his efforts through Kolkata Ventures in the past 3 years have resulted in more than 400 revenue generating startups responsible for around 4500 new jobs created in 10 states of east india He has had five more than five hundred speaking engagements in U.S. and India, including White House panel for entrepreneurship education, Startup America, Invest India at Rashtrapati Bhavan, TEDx talks, Josh talks, and more. More than one fifty awards in India, U.S., Canada, and China. More than eighteen hundred startup mentees in India, U.S., Canada, and China. He is an influential youth icon with a monthly reach of two lakh youths over social media. Please mel- uh, welcome, Mr. Avello Roy. See, welcome. Thank you very much, Sonali, for the nice introduction. Thank you, everyone. Nice to meet all of you. Um, so I'll quickly uh, start sharing my screen. Can everybody see? Yes, we can see. Okay. Can I get a quick uh, yes from all of you so that I know you are all able to see and hear me clearly? in the chat section if you can just say yes okay so i i want you guys to be a little bit more participative so you can ask me questions as we go along uh through this you don't have to wait till the end if there's something burning you ask me i'll stop i'll pause in the middle i'll, I'll respond to you and then come back so there's nothing that's like not settling in um okay i will get through so this is basically about investment strategy uh during and post covid 19 so all the lockdown and everything that's happening the craziness so make a little bit of sense of that so uh, i'll tell you a little bit about my background and my story actually sonali did mention a little bit but what you don't know is i started my first startup when i was uh actually going through the last recession which is from 2008 2009 and uh, during that time we not only built it uh, to a multi million dollar valuation but we also uh, got the team together we utilized the actual opportunity of of the crisis that the economic downturn of 10% unemployment and all of that so so i'll tell you a little bit about that so that kind of gives you an understanding how an entrepreneur thinks about crisis right so uh so here you can see you know as a student entrepreneur we were entrepreneur idol uh, you know we got a team together this is happening in chicago uh 115 business plan competitions in us and canada uh, and you know everything was going great uh, we were being mentored by billionaires and millionaires these are like the uh, ceos of motorola at the time uh, their grandfather had started the company uh, later on uh, one of them chris galvin became i think ceo of uh, nokia i believe so so amazing people you know these people were uh, mentoring us telling us how uh, to not do the mistakes they did and all of that was going great till uh, this we graduated in 2009 and the recession struck us 10% unemployment people were losing jobs and all the other startups that were uh, around us were competing for the same investors were competing for the same resources they realized that this is not the time to build a startup so most of them quit and what happened was uh, because they quit for us the life became easier so what happens is during this recession because the news media everything everybody is talking so negatively 
uh, as an entrepreneur, uh, you know, if you're not, you're not one of those people in the crowd, you see it as an opportunity because then there's less competition for the same resources that you're competing for. So the investors who are getting a hundred emails a day are now getting 50 emails a day or 25 emails a day and you're one of them. So you're competing with less people. So you're more visibility. And as the recession went through, more and more startups kept dying and kept uh, uh, leaving and getting jobs and whatnot. And me and my co-founder decided we will never quit. We will do whatever it takes, right? And so what we ended up doing was we were in one month away from being homeless. We had just one month's rent left and Chicago is a very cold city, you know. Uh, so what we did was I, I love baking and cooking. So uh, on one of my friends told me, well, we should send these cheese biscuits that you make so well. They're so good. I said, okay. So uh, we started this cheese biscuit business. It's a weekend business. So on Saturdays, I would bake for eight hours. On Sundays, I would sell for, for eight to 10 hours on farmer's market, which is like literally on the streets of Chicago, along with people selling vegetables and selling coffee, tea. We were selling cheese biscuits, big engineers from a very reputable university, you know, uh, had uh, building a business. So that was our option. And trust me when I say it, we made 600% profit. We were profitable within 30 days. And this business taught us marketing, customer relationship, so many things. It was a Jugar business and it sustained us. We were making $3,000 a month from this business. And Monday to Friday, we were doing a technology business. And Saturday, Sunday, we were doing this food business to just sustain ourselves. And I tell you, it was such an experience. It was very scary. And just as summer was about to end, and we were like, oh my God, you know, we cannot sell on the streets in the winter. What are we going to do? You know, by God's grace, uh, we got an investment firm interested in investing in us and literally they made their investment decision in 10 minutes. They talked to us in 10 minutes. They're like, we are going to invest in you. Done. We're going to do a little bit of due diligence, but 21 days you'll get your check. And they, they kept their promise in 21 days we got our check and first investment and in the recession, right? So, so that was amazing. And it was, uh, it was very tiring. Of course, we were doing a full-time startup full-time a second startup to sustain ourselves, but no jobs, and we didn't give up, and, and we made it through, right? <laughs> In fact, uh, the Huffington Post, which at that time had just uh, become a massive uh, news agency online, they, they wrote about us, that everybody's quitting and these guys won't give up, despite the economy, college grads set to launch innovative product, right? So they talked about, uh, you can see my name here, Velo Roy, Edward Suda, co-founders, uh, Illinois Institute of Technology. So they're like, they're talking about, they made a whole series about us and how these entrepreneurs won't give up and that is why they will succeed. And, and we did, you know. Uh, we built amazing team together, uh, you know, ex-CTO of Motorola, uh, ex-head uh, of marketing for L'Oreal, uh, head of uh, innovations for Wrigley, uh, Steel Tycoon. So these guys had everything. They had the Ferrari, they had the beach house, they had crores worth of uh, package, everything they had. So why did they join two teenagers, me and Edward? Because what they were missing was that fun, that adventure in their life, the ability to touch lives, do something and see that people's lives transform. That's what was missing in their lives. And that's why they joined us. And in that economy also, uh, they took the risk to join us and build a startup together. Now, what happened was we got in, rejected by 300 venture capitalists, 300 rejections. I mean, that's a lot of rejection, right? Uh, and they were all with me and we kept on going through one after another. And many of the rejections were like, come back in three months. Now we're not ready. We don't have money, no liquidity. You're not ready. You don't have traction, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So we kept on building traction and kept on pitching to investors. Till there was one investor. This guy was an ABCD, as we call it, American born, confused Desi. So, so they don't know if they're American. They look like Indian. So their passports is America. Uh, but they're all completely desi. So these guys really hate Indians, most cases, you know, not stereotyping. So this fellow just ripped me to shreds, you know, in the investor meeting. And when I came down, I still remember Aeon Center, that building, I came down and I was crying. I was like, I can't do this anymore. I'm done. And this lady standing next to me, Jackie, you know, she put her arm around me. I said, Avello, we left everything to join you. You cannot give up. We are depending on you. And that was very inspirational. And I tell you, 
month from that day, we got investment. So if that day I had quit and Jackie didn't inspire me, I wouldn't be talking to you, right? I'd be sitting in some cubicle in Chicago doing some simple job. Right? Uh, but that's the beauty of having a world-class team, a team that inspires you. You don't only inspire them, but when you are down, they also push you up and together you build something, you know? So we built these companies together uh, in US, Canada, Hong Kong, India, so Kolkata Ventures being the first week in India. I came back in 2016. I started Kolkata Ventures and, and that has become the largest startup incubator in East India. I'm very proud of it. 412 revenue generating startups, multiple investments, uh, and, and even two of our startups were investment during lockdown, right? Uh, you, you, when you do things at a young age, you get a lot of uh, name and fame. So, and that's a good thing. It opens up doors. It uh, allows you to get access to people who wouldn't let you get access. You know. So, so as a young entrepreneur doing things, US, India, I've gotten uh, enough publicity that helps me to reach more people and help more people like you guys, right? And and Kolkata Ventures, our our goal is to fuel our dream. You know, your dream. Uh, make it all happen. 400, like I said, 400 plus startups. We are in three countries now: Germany and Australia. Are there uh, two exits already uh, within a very short period that we have existed. 10 crores funds raised just this year, right? Uh, <clears throat> these are some of our uh, really powerful startups that are making more than four lakhs a month. Uh, these have already gotten funded. The rest are on their way to getting funded. Right. And some, like I said, some of them got funded during the lockdown period, which is fantastic. I also teach at some of the prime uh, institutes in the world. Uh, so there is the six IITs, three IIMs, Northwestern University, Kellogg School of Business, as well as Illinois Institute of Technology, which is my university. Right. So COVID-19. So it's actually a, a, an opportunity. Why? there are demands that were not there that have come up because of COVID-19. And if you ride that demand of COVID-19, you can actually grow with it rather than die because of it. So you have to pivot. You have to figure out a new way of doing business, right? And I'm going to talk more about that. But the point is anything physical is going to be dead for a little bit. Anything digital is going to be thriving. Like I would never do webinars uh, from November to uh, till 10th March, I was on a flight three times a week, speaking, talking to entrepreneurs, you know, uh, mentees, just going around the country. Last 70 days, I am at home and I was forced to do webinars. And I just realized the power of webinars. It's so powerful. I'm able to talk to, I'm in three cities in one day, which I couldn't do when I'm on a flight, you know, flying to one place only. So it's great. I, I love the digital economy. I love things digital. And Kolkata Ventures has also been, focusing on virtual incubation from 2016 and today it's more relevant than ever before where people are not able to leave their homes go to co-working spaces we are virtually incubating our startups from around the country and and the world now uh, so which is fantastic so COVID-19 is an opportunity for you to uh, take what you're doing and pivot that to to digital and and align it with the demands of COVID-19 and post-COVID-19. And I'm going to give you more analysis and data based on it. Now, one of the biggest things about COVID-19 is working from home. It has become a norm. It is no more a thing that people were like, oh, work from home, nothing gets done, and, and all of that. Now, what do you have access to? You have access to the most talented people in the world for the cheapest amount of money because they can be sitting in some village. In, in fact, the first slide you saw that the flyer that was made by a little boy in Rajasthan for 100 rupees. Can you believe it? 100 rupees. Uh, I was paying 40,000 rupees to my graphic designer. Uh, and this guy is doing my graphics for 100 rupees a graphic. I mean, I'm shocked. Uh, but I'm able to access him because I don't, I'm not limited by hiring somebody in my Delhi office or Calcutta office or Hyderabad office. I'm focused on anybody working remotely. So my cost has gone down. I'm getting talent, right? I'm able to communicate clearly through video chat what's left. So remote working is huge. In fact, I'll tell you uh, one, of my, one of our startups in Kolkata Ventures, they were a co-working space owner, 5,000 uh, seater in uh, a tier two city. And I was like, dude, you're going to get slammed. Uh, what, what are you going to do? How are you going to pivot? So we helped him out. We said, okay, you know what? This is what we're going to do. Work from home is such a 
powerful concept right now. All these big, big companies are spending so much money shipping computers, you know, desktops from office to people's, their employees' homes. Why don't you ship co-working space to their homes? How? Foldable table, foldable chair, laptop, and a dongle for internet. Send it over to people, ship it over to people's houses. And he already is making so much money right now. He's profitable already, you know, in this venture because he already had the furniture, furniture connects laptop. Uh, we already have another business that we consult with. That's a hundred crore India based laptop manufacturing company, right? So it's amazing. You're able to ship the office to the house of those who want to work from home for big companies like TCS, Capgemini, IBM, and all of these guys. Right. So he's pivoted his business from co-working to shipping work from home kit to your house and it's working beautifully. So you need to figure out how you want to do this, you know, where you can make money during COVID-19 and, you know, grow your business and get investment. Now you're going to fail. Of course, there's going to be difficulties. It's not going to be easy. Many people are not successful because they failed to fail enough number of times. They fear, let fear hold them back. Right. Powerful statement. When you were learning to walk. Did you falter and fail? Yes. Did your parents tell you, beta, you cannot walk for the rest of your life? No. They said, try again, try again, try again. So similarly, yes, COVID-19 is a new thing. It's a whole global pandemic. It's a new situation we've never faced. In the last 100 years, we've never faced it. Of course, we will try new things and fail. But the point is, this is the new normal. There's going to be a lot of new normals here onwards. And you need to understand that that is not going to change for a long time. So better get used to it and adapt to it or you'll die, right? Okay, so investor strategies for startups during post COVID-19. Right? That's what the topic is today. So let's jump right into it. These are the different categories of investors. You start with friends, family, fools. They just invest because they love you, right? There is crowdfunding, which is still available where people are throwing their money because they want to be early adopters. Uh, one of my mentees, she, uh, you know, iPhones have speaker at the bottom. So what she did was she took a Starbucks coffee cup mug, uh, took the lid and put it around and put it under her phone, made a video out of it, put it on Kickstarter. She was trying to raise $10,000. She raised $330,000. Went to China, built a plastic version of that. And she already had customers before she even had the product. That's the power of crowdfunding. It's basically a platform where people are allowed to invest in a startup. And one of our Kolkata Venture startups, uh, CrowdPouch, is the first crowdfunding platform for startups in India. We have crowdfunding platforms for people dying, you know, people raising money for cancer and all that. But for startups, CrowdPouch is the first one. And, and we as Kolkata Ventures are proud to incubate them and invested also, uh, you know, um, they have gotten investment from some of our investors. So <coughs> it's a fantastic opportunity crowdfunding platform. Next time, angel investors. These are generally people who are high net worth individuals. That means their net worth is above $2 million. Now, these guys tend to be CXOs of big companies or consultants or chartered accountants or you know, big guys who have not necessarily built a startup or they have built a startup and they have got an exit and with that money, they're investing. But generally, when there are six CXOs or employees or consultants, these guys are not very risk taking. So they are not investing right now. They're holding on to their liquidity. And they're making sure that, you know, once things get better, they will invest in startups, but now is not the time. They will not be investing in startups because they're scared. They'd rather invest in day trading with stocks and whatnot, but angel investors who are from the background of employment are not investing because they're just not entrepreneurial and that's okay. That's who they are. Venture capitalists on the other side are very different. They are people who might have not invested their own money, but they are having investors who have pulled in money into their fund and generally every vc fund has a 10-year life cycle where they promise their investors that in 10 years i'm going to give you 10 times money uh, return so find out venture capitalists who have who are at the beginning or the mid area of their tenure they're not at the end then they will be having guns but the point is they are uh, almost pushed to deploy their funds as soon as possible because they know uh, the money will come back to them only when they deploy it, right? And a lot of the startups will fail. 90% of the startups will fail. So the 10% that succeed is going to make up for the 90% that failed. And that's how they're going to make their money back. 
to their investors. So a lot of these VC funds are investing and they're, they have a gun to their head because they have, they're on a time uh, schedule to invest the money. So many of the startups that are getting invested, you'll see are from VC funds or angel networks, but there is a timeline involved. They cannot wait for lockdown to go away or COVID-19 to go away. They are looking to invest and they're looking to invest now, just like people are wanting to invest in stock markets because the price is cheap, right? Everything has crashed. Similarly, a lot of entrepreneurs, startup investors, uh, startup entrepreneurs are struggling to pay salaries, struggling with liquidity. So investors are taking this opportunity to get a better valuation, a better pricing and invest. So in venture capitalists are big on this. Corporate investors, these are people like, let's say, uh, uh, Times of India has uh, uh, an investment firm. Uh, Amazon has investment firm. Google Ventures, uh, Xiaomi Ventures, Samsung Ventures. All these companies invest money along with services. So let's say you have an app business and you want a million downloads. But if you look at the cost of customer acquisition to get to, if you do Facebook ads, Instagram ads and whatnot, to get a million downloads, it might be up to hundred rupees a download for your app, hundred rupees. So that's basically, you know, you're talking, you know, close to hundred million dollars. Uh, that's a lot of money. Now, it's not always going to be 100. It's going to be natural progression also if your app is good. So let's say it's even $10 million, but that's a lot of money. So what Samsung Ventures and companies that are phone companies, what do they do? They say, okay, I'm going to give you half a million dollars. You make this product unique to my phone and I'm going to make sure I'm going to give you downloads into a million phones, right? How? When the software update happens, your app will be pre-installed on my phone in the target area you want, whether it's urban, whether it's rural, I'm going to make sure that happens. You save $10 million, you get half a million dollars, you, you know, make the app a little customized for their needs, and you have so many customers looking at you. Powerful uh, opportunity. And these guys are also under the gun. They have a venture fund that they need to invest, there's a timeline involved, and they want to get in, right? Banks and government agencies, now with the 20 lakh crore, uh, uh, thing. So, so it's always been the fund of funds, right? But certain venture capital firms are connected with the government. So they, they invest a crore, the government invests one crore, you know, so there's a matching investment. It's called fund of funds. So anyway, the government of India had 10,000 crores uh, put into it. State governments had 100 crores, 500 crores, you know, different states, different money. And now with COVID-19, they have been put in more money into SMEs, small and medium-sized businesses. So if you get investment, you get matching investment from the government. And also you can get loans uh, up to two crores in some cases, uh, in some other cases, they could be less or more. But the point is, uh, and there's automated loans also coming up. So basically till February, if you had accounts uh, payables that you're not able to pay because of COVID-19, whatever that amount is, I think 10% of that, you can get automated loan like that, where the government takes a guarantee, which is powerful. So a lot of money floating around during COVID-19. Uh, if you're intelligent, uh, you, will, you will grab these opportunities that I'm telling you. Now, investors look for something. What do they look for? They look for you as a founder, that do you have validated skill and will, high energy, high ethics and skills. The proven skills. That's why IIT IM background guys get funded. Why? Because they've proven they're intelligent. But even if you are not from IIT IM background, that's okay. Have you done any job? Have you done any internship? Have you done anything that shows that you can execute? You have to have some projects or internships or jobs or some history or some awards or board of advisors where people trust you. They see big industry leaders are saying, I trust this guy. So that's how people trust you. So something that validates you as a founder, that validates you, your co-founding team as for execution, your market validation. Market should say, yes, we love your product. How? Google Analytics, daily active users, daily mon uh, uh, monthly active users, weekly active users, right? A letter of intent, if you're a B2B company, that a, a big uh, client is saying, yes, if you can make this, I will buy it. So some form of market validation, geographical proximity, most investment uh, firms want uh, to invest in a, look, in a local state where their uh, startup is, right? Uh, now with COVID-19 work from home, a lot of those investment firms are opening up. They are investing outside their state also, uh, but do check that. Traction, very important. You can have a beautiful slides, but if you have not achieved anything so far, then uh, what is it that you really are, right? It's, it's no value. So traction is very, very important. Scalability. 
are you tech enabled scalable, right? It could be, for example, let's say your restaurant business. If you build three restaurants, your cost goes up and so does your profitability, your, your revenue. But it's not a scalable business. Why? Because your cost and profit are in proportion. What is scalable? You have the same cost, but your proportionally your revenue, your profitability goes up. So that's, that means, let's say you built three restaurants, now you have a brand, people recognize you, and you give your brand as a franchisee to, to other companies, right? And the franchisee, you can just charge for it, and people pay for it, and they invest in the infrastructure of your restaurant, and then you're a scalable business model. Oh, that is interesting, right? Or you build an app. You build one app, but that gets downloaded into one crore phones. Now that's a scalable business model that you can scale throughout the country, throughout the world. So scalability, imagine a year from now, 5G technology is coming. Are you ready for it, right? Will you be relevant at that time? Are you ready for AR, VR? Are you ready for artificial intelligence? Now, I'm not saying you have to push technology in. I'm not saying you should do that. That's not healthy. But are you thinking in those terms? Will you evolve by them, right? Your evolutionary thought process is important for the investor to hear in your pitch deck. Go to market strategy. How are you going to acquire your first 100 customers? How are you going to acquire your first 1,000 customers? Are you, and now, if you say digital marketing, everybody does digital marketing. You know, like I said, if you really have to download 100 uh, um, million customers and you're going to pay 100 rupees cost per customer acquisition, you're spending 100 million dollars. Who's going to give you that? You have to think growth hacking. How are you going to use strategic partnerships? How are you going to use different methods to to not spend as much and yet get the traction, yet get the downloads, yet get the customers? How are you going to do it? Right? How are you going to steal your competitors' customers and bring them on board? Important part of your strategy, right? Uh, that's why we have this program at Polkata Ventures called uh, Make Your Startup Investor Ready. Right? We take you through all of this. We help you with your pitch deck. We make you ready for the investor because the, this is how you're judged. And 95% of startups don't make, get investment because they don't have these answers. They are really just clueless. They just go to the investor hoping investor is an ATM machine and investor will pay you for whatever your beautiful idea is. But it's not like that. Investor wants to see his money grow. So timeline for execution is important. How will you grow my money? That's what the investor wants to hear from your pitch deck. How will you grow my money? Uh, use of funds. Where are you spending your money? Are you investing in a big office and a nice looking uh, assistant? Or are you investing it in marketing and sales? Are you growing it? And your exit strategy. How are you going to give the investor his money back? Right? So is it through acquisition, acquire hire? Is it IPO? Uh, are you going to go public? What is your vision? What are some of your competitors doing? This is when you talk about your competitors, right? It's very, very important. Then the investor can see, acha, your competitors did it, so you can do it better if you're given right guidance. It's good to have competitors. Never say, I don't have a competitor. Even Airbnb and Uber, which are very uh, unique ideas, even they in their pitch deck talk about their competitors. Competitor means, where are your customers now? Who are they uh, getting their services from? And how can you do it better for them? That's your competitor, right? So if there's nothing you got out of this, there's one thing you should remember. Investors looking for people, credible team capable of execution. If you have this, rest of the things can be figured out. If you don't have this, your idea is brilliant, you're not going to succeed, guaranteed. A little bit of industry uh, analysis I'll do for you from my uh, research or what has come, not my research, but research of experts. And I've done research on research of experts. And this is kind of the common thing. So the industries that will be bust, travel and tourism, physical retail, malls will be closed for a while, a hospitality industry, uh, so hotels and uh, restaurants, many restaurants are closing already. I think 70% of the restaurants are uh, predicted to close. Uh, so that's very, very scary. A lot of these five-star hotels are closing. Automotive industry, people are working from home. They don't need Ola, Uber. Ola is already, uh, Uber has already been firing people, right? Uh, malls, theaters, restaurants, luxury goods. If you don't have anyone to show off what you're going to do, you're, you're at home. Uh, real estate is going to go down. Great time to buy and invest in real estate, of course, because it's going to go up after two, three years. Uh, oil and natural gas, again, down, down, down. Construction, down. Live events like concerts and sports events, down. What will thrive? Actually, the list is more. And what would boom? Imagine. Chemicals, anything to do with chemicals, FMCG, fast moving consumer goods, gonna be huge, right? People are more going to more into sanitizing and all that. Pharma is gonna grow leaps and bounds. 
healthcare is going to grow, health tech, health at your home, medicine delivery, digital entertainment, uh, right? So people are more watching Netflix and more content, more OTT platforms, even movies are getting launched on Amazon Prime. PVR and Inox are scared what to do. I mean, nobody's going to the, the movie theaters uh, the next at least 10 months. So online delivery of groceries, medicines, essential goods, amazing. They don't have people. If you can provide people power, if you can provide last minute delivery, you're in great situation. Uh, gig economy. This is the new way of doing business. Many are going to lose jobs. Many people are going to lose jobs and they're not looking for jobs. They want to self-sustain themselves. They want to be freelancers. They want to work when they want. They want to chill when they want. So gig economy. Stock market investing. People are making loads of money on daily uh, trading. I don't know about this. I'm not giving you investment decisions, but this is a growing market. People are learning from Udemy and investing in stocks and many young teenage boys and girls are making lots of money. Mental health. People are going to be depressed. Uh, divorces are happening. A lot of issues. So mental health related businesses are doing well. In fact, one mental health startup got funded, I think, day before yesterday. Insurance is going to grow because people are scared. A lot of insurance opportunities there. Gaming opportunities. People are bored at home. They're going to play games. So a lot of new game gaming technology is coming up. Again, with 5G technology, gaming is going to be up there with extended reality, virtual reality, augmented reality, and all of that. 4D technology. So gaming is huge and growing. Data science, so much data created. New digital economy has been created. New digital products are being sold and resold. You know, right? Resellers, affiliate marketers, all these data, so much social media. A, a one person is being hit by Google ads, YouTube ads, Facebook ads, and the advertisers want to know which is working. Is it email marketing? Is it Google? Is it YouTube? Is it Facebook? Is it LinkedIn? Is it TikTok? Is it uh, uh, Instagram? They want to know. So a lot of data analysis, data engines, data visualization is going to be massively profitable, right? And astrology and religious things will also grow because people are scared. They want to know the future. If you have a startup related to astrology, uh, psychology, uh, tarot, uh, occult sciences, it's going to do well during this time. I'm not saying it, researchers are saying it, right? Okay. Uh, so again, if we didn't get anything out of that and I was speaking too fast because I don't have too much time, uh, this is simple. Growth of digital economy and death of physical. So manufacturing and all of the, although they're moving to India from China and all that, good stuff, but at least one and a half years right so digital if you want to make right now money right now go digital any way you can if you need help reach out to me my name is avello roy i'm the only person in this world with that name you can find me on linkedin i'm happy to help you out i can find me on instagram just reach out to me i'll be you know kolkata ventures is here to help uh, this is a picture with the prime minister of nepal you can see here uh, so modi ji had sent us a couple of years back when he got elected and Ritu is here. Ritu is actually the owner of Business X. Uh, so uh, Ritu is here. Many of my friends, Ritesh is there, uh, who's the owner of uh, Oyo Rooms, right? Uh, so amazing uh, opportunity where we got to meet the Prime Minister and, and kind of consult with him. And he was asking, what can I do for Nepal? And one of the things I told him was, Mr. Prime Minister, uh, your Nepalese engineers in Nepal have the same opportunity as those in Silicon Valley. Right, because he was saying, Oh, we don't have right roads, we don't have infrastructure, everything. And like, none of those matter because think digital. If you can make money digitally, you know, it doesn't matter if you're in Nepal or Silicon Valley or Delhi or Bombay. It's, it's the same thing. You just have to have internet, phone, and laptop, and you can make money wherever you are. It doesn't matter. And, and Nepal has transformed. One of my, you know, one of the, uh, my dear friends, Sikshit. He has built a multi-million dollars business copying Uber for bikes because in Nepal, they don't have too many cars, but they have a lot of bikes, right? And there are so many copies of Paytm, there's copies, so all these digital businesses have come up and they're making so much money in Nepal. So the whole Nepal economy has risen uh, because of the digital economy. And now they've moved to China. They, they look to China to help. Anyway, I'm not going to get political about it. But the point is, uh, same thing applies to all of us here, right? all of us here. Uh, so know that. Okay. Um, so I'll end it here. Again, if you need any help, kolkataventures.com, you can go there. 
uh, whether it's funding, whether it's guidance, mentorship, whatever it is that I can help you with or my team can help you with, we are here to support your uh, cause. And again, Business X is here. Uh, we have a whole community of people who are helping entrepreneurs and this is your time to rise and shine. This is the time to you know, really start your startup. You'll probably never get this opportunity. Such a long lockdown where you have extra time, you have internet and you can grow. Okay. In fact, I don't have internet to be honest. Like in Calcutta, we had this cyclone. I'm just using my phone data. I was telling uh, Sodali, I'm like, I don't know if I can do this webinar. My phone data is hardly working, but even then I'm here for you, right? We made it happen. I hope you could hear the whole presentation uh, and, and appear. So any questions, please uh, feel free to uh, ask right away. Thank you so much, Avelo. It was so amazing, such an amazing session. And thank you so much for sharing your personal experiences and your insights. Uh, I'm sure everyone loved it. And uh, yeah, you were actually able to answer a lot of questions already. But we do have some questions. Uh, I'll just read them out for you and you Please. can answer. Okay, so the first question is, uh, which sectors will be given preference by investors post-COVID? Now, I think you've already covered that uh, in the previous slide. So, yeah, anything else you would like to add to it or something? Again, very much focusing on the digital aspect, on the healthcare aspect, uh, anything that is from home, even parties at home, right? Uh, companies that are providing that, that how you can, Netflix, uh, you have, you get food delivered to your house and then you equipment to your home, so entertainment at home. So anything you can do at home, delivery, digital, that's the way uh, things are going to move and that's a, you can make money right now as we speak. Great. Um, so the next question is from Mr. Saurav. He says, is it right to pitch for ideas to investors from sectors that are badly hit by COVID like tourism or event management? First, uh, pivot your, your business. So yes, tourism has been hit. Uh, event management, so for example, the business X is owned by, uh, I think Ritu, Ritu is the owner, right? Ritu and her husband. Uh, uh, yes, Ritu right. mom so, and her husband, Gaurabhan. Right. So they do 600 events in a year, 600. That's not a joke. 365 days, so they're basically doing two events a day. Now, and I'm seeing them doing so many webinars and whatnot, so they've pivoted, uh, right? So you need to figure out how you're going to pivot your business, which is in tourism, which is in uh, uh, live events. And then the pivoted event, you can pitch to invest. Like for example, our startup that I talked about with the co-working space, who was like, what do we do? But they pivoted to shipping your office to your home, work from home kit. Now that he's pitching to investors and he already has half a million dollars committed, right? So first pivot, then pitch. Great. Um, so the next question is uh, from someone who says, I own a chandelier and fancy light showroom. Basically, I'm a retailer. Can you suggest how can I digitalize my business besides registering on e-commerce platform? Certainly. So uh, you don't have to do much with digital. Just, I'm sure you have a lot of clients who have a lot of your chandeliers. Tell them to share a three second or a five second video of how that chandelier makes their room look as opposed to without it, right? Get maybe 10 or 15 of them, make a collage of 45 seconds. Put that across social media because as people work from home more, they're gonna focus on making the house more pretty because they are spending more time at home. Before it used to be, I just come to sleep at home, right? It's only for weekends. But now people are going to spend more on making the houses pretty. So get real testimonials from people of how your chandeliers make people's houses look uh, and make a video out of it and share it. You will see your sales will grow like anything. Perfect. Um, so the next question uh, is from someone who says, I'm a software guy and started my own business a few months ago. Should I use artificial intelligence to accelerate business in the coming times? So you're a software engineer. You know this as much as I do. Uh, that artificial intelligence doesn't uh, show its magic unless there is a data set, it's long enough data set. It's like a child, everything goes in the mouth, then the child realizes, oh, food goes in the mouth, shoes don't go in the mouth, right? But it takes a lot of trials and errors to figure that out. So just don't use artificial intelligence for the sake of saying it because in investors are intelligent enough to understand. 
only when you have a data set or you're using, let's say Google, you're piggybacking on Google or Amazon's engine and using their data sets to uh, enable artificial intelligence, then do it. Don't do it for the heck of it. You can pull in intelligence into your product. That is okay. It can be an intuitive product. Just like expert systems have existed since 1960s. Since computers have existed, expert systems have existed. Artificial intelligence is the evolution of expert systems. So intelligence is there in products, but if you just throw AI, IoT buzzwords like that, trust me, I and many other people hear investment pitches all day long. And the moment people say this, it's like, oh God, another one. This is the reaction. And the reaction is because unless you have a data set, unless you're a big company, you cannot afford to have so much data. Or you're piggybacking, you have a strategic partnership with a big company like a Samsung or a Google, then you have that data and then you can say AI. So only when you have that, say AI, backed by a massive big data. Otherwise, you are cheapening yourself because everybody says AI. Great. Um, so the next question is, how the valuation can be calculated for startups when pitched to raise funds? Um, if you ask an accountant, they're going to give you formulas. If you ask an entrepreneur who has raised money over and over again and invested, it's emotions. It's not about any formula, to be honest. I have seen people uh, with an idea on a sketch, on a piece of paper, getting $10 million funding and people with traction and uh, 70 lakhs uh, you know, monthly revenue not getting funding. So the point is, it's about relationships, it's about trust. You will not give 10 rupees to a beggar, right? Uh, unless there is something, something that makes you feel like I should give. So similarly, an investor, Oh, I'm not saying you're a beggar or anything like that. Don't get me wrong. Wrong example. Sorry. <laughs> what I'm trying to say here is when we don't know someone or they don't come recommended or there is no validation, it's difficult to trust them with the money. So have a board of advisors. But people are like, I don't know the entrepreneur, but I know those guys on the board of advisors. And because of them, I want to invest in the company, right? Uh, that helps. So your credibility of your co-founding team, yourself, your board of advisors, all of that helps. That adds your valuation. So valuation has two things. Tangible assets, Intangible assets. Most startups don't have tangible assets. Tangible assets are what? Laptop, tables, shares, whatever, right? Physical things. Unless you're a manufacturing company. Then you have machines and whatnot. But intangible assets, your reputation, uh, the board of advisors you have, the engineers you have. Right? When echo hire happens, the companies value each engineer at 100,000 to a million dollars per engineer, the value, right? That's how they acquire a company. So the point is, what you have intangibly makes a lot of sense. Your patents, your uh, press media coverage, every like on your Instagram, Facebook, right? All of those have value because they're your reputation, your Google analytics. What is it saying about daily active users, monthly active users, stickiness? How much time are people spending on your app or product? All of those come together to say, this is what your valuation is. And then it's your word versus your investor. And you both argue and negotiate. You should negotiate. You come to a common ground where you both agree, ha, huh, this sounds right. It's about this sounds right, right? And then the CA <laughs> makes it right on paper and the lawyer comes and does this shareholders agreement and you both sign up and you have you know, happy money and equity ones. Makes sense? I hope it does. Yeah, it does. Uh, great. So the next question is, uh, many of the new startups get funding, but many startups don't know how to contact venture capitalists. Can you shed some light on this? Yes, uh, the biggest mistake that people do, and I get so many messages every day, people just reach out to you thinking it's your duty to give them money. You know, and we are not, investors are not bound to invest, right? So, uh, so if you're writing to somebody saying, looking for investment, the next line is, uh, can you give me eight to 10 lakhs for my startup or 82 uh, lakhs to a crore for my startup? I'm like, can you please tell me your name and a little bit of introduction about yourself and your startup before you ask me for money? So the important thing is to not disrespect the investors. It's it, as uh, common sense as that might be, but please understand, write to somebody. If you write to somebody saying, I want your money, it's not very respectful. A good way to start a conversation is, I really appreciate what you're doing. Uh, I really appreciate the posts that you're posting. I've been following you for a long time. Butter them up a little bit, right? And so seeking your expert advice. The place where you get rejected is the subject line. The subject line, if it is like looking for investment, it's like by another person come here. I don't even know you. Either you say referred by a friend, that a name that investor can recognize, or you say seeking your expert advice. And then say, want five minutes of your time. 
to just get your guidance. When you push them up as a guide or a mentor, they feel the ego has been boosted. They want to help you. And that's when they're invested emotionally in you. There's a little trust and liking. And then you can say, what would you suggest for investment? And then they might say, okay, I can look at it. You can give me your pitch deck and let me see if it's interesting. So you go step by step. You don't just jump into bed. Just like on a date. You just don't tell the person the same day, let's hook up. You take it out for dinner. You give some roses and all that. And slowly, slowly you, you know, okay, not giving dating advice. The point is, make it step by step. Don't make it like, boom, here, copy. And worst is copy paste messages. Dear sir or madam. You don't even know if I'm a sir or a madam and you expect me to write you a check. <laughs> you know, so, so please don't be a machine. Treat an investor like a human being. Reach out to them. Buttered them up a little bit. They are people with high equals, right? It's just how it, it's normal. Uh, so that's the way to do it. Perfect. Um, so the next question is a bit controversial. So uh, someone says, to what extent should we disclose investors about our business so that it doesn't get copied? Is it 100% safe? And now yeah. I myself see a lot of startups asking this question to me as well. And I always uh, tell them the answer, but if you can just say it more clearly. Yeah. Uh, don't expect investors to sign non-disclosure agreements. No one will. Uh, having said that, do investors, ha many investors have a reputation of stealing ideas? Yes, uh, it, it is true. In fact, one of my investors did that. Not with me, but somebody else. And he was trying to put me into it. And like, I'm an entrepreneur. I know how, how it feels. Don't. I won't do it. Uh, but the point is, yes, if your idea is stealable and you're just an idea, then please trust me, it's going to be stolen and you can do nothing about it. Even if you don't talk about it, 10 months from now, somebody will have the bright idea and they'll do it. You're not the only one with that idea. A. So the way to do it is speed. If you have something, start working on it, show traction, build traction. So if somebody's copying you, they will always be behind you because with your creative juices, with your innovation, with your hunger in the belly, a copycat can never keep up because you have fire in the belly and you're the creative innovator. They'll always be behind you. Speed is important. And if you don't have a barrier to entry, you don't have a business. So you have to have certain hooks. For example, you have a good engineer that can build fast, or you have a great strategic partnership that helps you, you know, pulls you faster. So you have to have a hook. Otherwise, an investor will think, why should I give him the money? I have developers, I have designers, I have money, I can I have the right people. I can do this faster than you. Why should I give you the money? But when they see you have already done the hard work, you have traction, and it makes sense to partner with you, put money in you because you can do it better than me, and you already have the team in place, you already are ahead of the game, and you're, it's faster to grow with you than to steal your idea. And then obviously somebody, even if he wants to steal the idea, they'll grow with you, right? So don't, do the, don't do the blame game. You're not a baby anymore. So don't be like investor stealing my idea. No, be such that investor doesn't want to steal the idea. They want to invest in you and grow with you. Very, very well explained. Um, so the next question is, can a proprietor registered business get any investment? It's, uh, you might get H&I investment, uh, where there's an angel investment, but a venture fund or a professional investor will not invest unless it's a private limited company. So it's a requirement to have a private limited company if you want outside investment. Okay. Even in uh, a private company, you might have issues with, uh, with H and I also. So private limited company is a must for investment. Um, so the next question is how to create brand equity in the present scenario? Um, educate people. So know who's your industry, who's your market. Uh, again, I'll go back to Ritu's uh, beautiful array of companies, Restaurant India, Franchise India, Startup uh, Entrepreneur India, all these companies, if you look at it, they all have blogs, they have content, they have videos, they have webinars. What are they doing? They're educating the market. And then what happens? People understand you're the market leader and they come to you for the services that these companies offer, right? So educate the industry that you're in. That proves you as expert. When you are proven to be the expert, people naturally come to you to solve their problem and you get paid. Perfect. Um, so the next question is, how do you think the education sector will evolve post-COVID? Uh, 
So there's a lot of noise in the education sector. Now, because of Baiju's, many of the people are thinking they can be the next Baiju's, but you have to have something more. I'll tell you the, the, the biggest hurdle here. Uh, most educational institutions are run by people who are money hungry. And they need to have either bribes or they need to have people, I'm being very honest here, right? We have many ed tech startups and I know how this uh, goes on. Uh, many of them are only working with a, a business development guy. So for example, if you're an ed tech company trying to get into a college or a school, find a competitor who has a regional head for business development. That person has already a relationship of 10, 15 years with the schools and colleges, and they will get you in very easily, you know, for 20, 30% off uh, success fee. Uh, that's the way to do it. Now, is there a need? Yes. Is it saturated? Yes. Can you do something better? Yes. Uh, students are still needing things. Education is not just school college education. There's executive education. There is uh, the colleges are re going to realize that uh, people are going to work from home. People are going to study from home. So what can we do better? What can we do in this uh, scenario where you see all these videos, memes of people just, uh, you know, showing their phone in front of the camera and showing the teacher how oh, I'm listening, you know, and they're not. How can you make it more exciting? How can you make it more fun? How can big universities get into your home, right? So there's a lot of room for innovation, but don't try to copy paste by juice. Then you're uh, really, there's a lot of uh, saturation in the market. But if you can do something unique where, uh, you know, connecting education with marketing, with the whole uh, funnel where, you know, it all works together and educational companies can use that to grow. It could be a very powerful B2B business. A lot of experts are losing jobs from Oyo and Zomato and Ola and Uber, and they're becoming consultants and they need customers. They don't know how to get them. If you can, so that's education also, right? If you can create something with trainers and coaches and whatnot, that's a big business. So a lot of opportunities there, but don't try to be another by juice. That's just a warning. <laughs> Sure. Um, so we are short of time. So we'll just take the last few questions very quickly. Uh, one is, uh, do you think is, is it a drawback when you do not have any co-founders, but have a good team to do the job? It's not a drawback. Um, it's just more painful for you. That's all. <laughs> Misery likes company. So when you have a co-founder, you can cry together when you're going through the, uh, the sleepless nights of a startup. When you're alone, you cry alone. Uh, but it's great to have a team uh, that's executing and uh, generally what happens is when in the process of funding, in the process of growth, you might come across somebody who is, uh, has complementary skills, who has skills you don't have and you have skills they don't have and both are high, uh, high skill, high will people and you become good friends and you say, let's be co-founders together. And it's perfectly okay uh, to get a co-founder a little down the line. Okay. Um, so the next question is, is Kolkata Ventures interested in social impacting ventures? Uh, also, what's your take on Agritech? So we have a lot of Agritech businesses uh, that are there and we work directly with the government of India, uh, with the Ministry of Agriculture also to help support uh, uh, these companies. Uh, so, so yes, there is. So we are not, uh, so Kolkata Ventures doesn't do anything that harms animals, uh, humans, or intoxication business or gambling business. We just don't touch those. But uh, anything that makes money ethically, uh, whether it's high impact social venture or agri-tech or, or whatever else, uh, but we try to focus more on digital business. But if there's a physical business with a digital element or there's a tech enabled scalability involved or we can help you become tech enabled scalable, we will definitely uh, be interested to see. Great. Um... So uh, one question is, is funding from banks a better option than funding from venture capitalists? Always. Are there any guidelines on what is better? Always. Uh, funding from banks is cheaper. Why? Because they're charging you interest. They're charging you money. What VCs are taking is equity. Equity today, it's like equity is here. Your uh, uh, cash is here. But eventually as your startup grows, equity is here, cash is here. So bank is going for the cash. They're just saying, give me a 15%, 20%. Not 20%, 15%, 12%, whatever interest, right? If you're going to start up India, it's 5%, 6% interest. So, so always better. Now, banks are more paperwork, more begging and pleading. A lot of banks will reject you, just like investors will also reject you. But far better to go with a the bank. They'll never come with a gun to your head. Investors will. Uh, so so be always better with banks, if you can get that done. 
Um, so one more question. Uh, how do you look at the China market impact on the Indian market? How can the Indian market recover when major support in terms of raw material accessories are being imported from China itself? I'm not educated enough to answer that question. <laughs> it is. Um, so I guess we'll just take the last question now. Um, it's from Mr. Santosh. Uh, he says, what are your suggestions on cloud-based micro ERP solutions for MSMEs to reach more customers in Pan-India and generate more revenue? Super. Uh, but again, there are many companies who are doing that. Micro ERPs for MSMEs, there are a lot of competition. Uh, look at what is missing in those MSMEs, actually uh, uh, in those uh, micro ERPs that are competing with you. So call them up as a customer and tell them what all do you offer. Talk to 15 of them. You will see there's a lot of common features that all of them offer. And there are features that none of them offer that might be your opportunity to, to provide that. And you can, if you can do better integrations with, again, marketing, sales, project management, all of that with the ERP system, uh, so that it's just a one-stop shop that works with the Trello, works with the Slack, works with the get response, works with MailChimp, works with Instamojo or Razorpay, you know, all of that. So that's where you really need to add value is integration because a lot of these businesses are just standalones, right? And somebody needs to put it all together and the CEO needs to see it all in one dashboard rather than going to Google Analytics and Salesforce and all of that, right? So if you can do that, uh, at least in my experience, uh, that would be a lot of value addition. Perfect. Um, so the last question is actually from Mr. Rahul Agarwal. He says, how are you feeling? <laughs> <laughs> uh, excited and also a little scared. I don't know what the future looks like, but an entrepreneur always likes the exciting journey where it's unpredictable. You make sense of a chaotic situation. Uh, that, that's, that's the feeling. Thank you very much for asking. That. Perfect. Uh, so thank you so much, uh, Evelo. It was absolutely amazing having you here. And thank you for being so patient while answering all the questions. Our session was supposed to be of 45 minutes, but we took it to one hour. So thank you so much for that. Most welcome. And have a wonderful time. I wish you all success to everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you to all our attendees. We hope you were able to add some value to your lives through this session. And if you have any further questions or anything, please uh, get in touch with me and I'll be happy to answer any questions you have. Also, we have another webinar uh, tomorrow only. It's about your opportunity in crisis. So how you can make the most of this period in crisis. So if you, and it's a free webinar again. So if you want to know any further details about that, please get in touch with me as well. Uh, until next time, uh, thank you so much. Stay home. And if you are going out, then please stay safe. Thank you so much. Thank you.